If you've ever seen a praying mantis in the wild, chances are you stopped and stared. This alien looking insect with its triangular head, spiked front legs, and huge bug-eyed stare doesn't just look cool. It's one of the most fascinating predators of the insect world. All right, so before we get into the weird stuff, the kung fu moves, the head chomping, and the alien eyes, we need to answer a very basic but important question. What exactly is a praying mantis? This is the science behind the praying mantis. At first glance, a praying mantis might look like another green bug in the garden, but this insect is a class of its own, literally. It belongs to the order Mantildea, which includes over 2,400 known species. And while they all have their own quirks and features, they all follow a general body plan that sets them apart from just about everything else in the insect world. But here's the thing, don't lump them with grasshoppers or walking sticks. Praying mantises may look a little bit like those guys, but genetically, they're a totally separate order. Their closest relatives are actually cockroaches and termites. That's right, this elegant, stealthy killer is a distant cousin to your kitchen cockroach. Evolution sure works in mysterious ways. Praying mantises are mostly found in warm climates. They dominate tropical and subtropical regions, especially in Africa, Asia, and South America. But you can find them in parts of Europe and North America. These insects are actually incredibly adaptable. You'll find them in gardens, meadows, forests, farms, deserts, and even urban areas. As long as there's prey and some cover, a mantis can thrive. Some species are canopy dwellers, others stay low among grass or leaf litter. And the most outrageous ones hang out among flowers, pretending to be petals, which, yes, we'll get into. Praying mantises go through a process called incomplete metamorphosis. Unlike butterflies or beetles, which go through the larvae, pupa, adult transition, mantises skip the whole cocoon thing. Here's how it works. The female lays a foamy, protective case called the uthica, which hardens and protects the developing embryos inside. Each uthica can hold 50 to 400 eggs, depending on the species. When it's time to hatch, usually after a few weeks or even months, the baby mantises emerge as nymphs. Now, this is where it gets intense. The nymphs look like tiny, wingless versions of the adult, but there's no friendly nursery. These newborns are often cannibalistic. The moment they hatch, some of them start attacking and eating their siblings, so survival of the fittest kicks in on day one. If you thought sibling rivalry was bad in your house, imagine hatching next to someone who wants to try to eat you for breakfast. The nymphs grow by molting, shedding their exoskeletons as they increase in size. Most species go through 5 to 10 molts before reaching adulthood, and molting is a vulnerable time. Until the new exoskeleton hardens, the mantis is soft and defenseless, so many will hide away during this process. And finally, after the last molt, they're fully grown adults, complete with wings. Though, not all species can fly, and some individuals, especially females, might have wings, but might be too heavy to lift off. Now, let's talk about that iconic pose. When a mantis holds its forelegs up like it's in a deep prayer, it's not showing reverence, it's arming itself. Those front legs are loaded with spines, and they fold back into a tight spring-loaded position. This isn't just a random pose, it's a perfectly designed ambush strategy. By tucking its legs up close, the mantis minimizes its visual profile, making it harder for prey or predators to see it. But the real trick is how fast it can strike from that position. We're talking lightning-fast reflexes, with the legs snapping out and grabbing the prey in a fraction of a second. And once it has you in its grip, those spines keep you there. Think of it as a bear trap made of the exoskeleton. Now here's something a lot of people don't know. Mantises are entirely solitary. They don't form colonies, they don't hunt in packs, they don't even hang out for fun. From the moment they hatch, praying mantises are on their own. That's partly because they are highly territorial. If two mantises cross paths and one is hungry, well, you can guess what happens next. Even during mating when they have to interact, things can end badly for the male, but more on that later. Their solitary nature also means that each individual is completely self-reliant. It has to find its own food, avoid predators, survive molting, and eventually reproduce, all without help. There's no teamwork here, just pure, raw instinct and precision. While all mantises share the same general anatomy, they come in an amazing variety of shapes, sizes, and colors. Some are bright green or earthy brown, great for blending into leaves and bark. Others have elaborate frills, horns, or leaf-like projections on their legs and bodies. There's even one that looks like a pile of moss, another that resembles a dead leaf so closely it can sit on the forest floor totally undetected. The orchid mantis, perhaps the most famous, is a vibrant pink and white species that looks exactly like a flower petal. And it doesn't just look pretty, it uses that disguise to lure in pollinators like bees and butterflies, which then it eats. That's not just camouflage, that's biological trickery. 
In terms of size, mantises range from tiny species that measure barely half an inch long to giants like the Chinese mantis, which can grow over four inches in length. And don't be fooled, bigger doesn't necessarily mean deadlier. Smaller mantises can be just as aggressive and efficient as hunting as their larger cousins. If nature had a blueprint for a biological assassin, the praying mantis would be it. Everything about this insect, from its alien-like head to its deadly arms and spring-loaded legs, is custom-built for stealth, speed, and precision. We'll start with the part that catches everybody's attention at first, the head. The praying mantis has one of the most bizarre heads in the animal kingdom. It's triangular, incredibly mobile, and completely unlike most other insects. For one, it can rotate its head up to 180 degrees. Think about that. This is extremely rare in the insect world. Most bugs can't even turn their heads at all. If they want to look around, they have to move their entire bodies, but not the mantis. It can swivel that little alien noggin left and right, scanning the world around it like a little green periscope. And that head is located with sensors. A mantis's eyes are enormous compared to the rest of the head, and they're compound eyes, meaning each one is made up of thousands of tiny units called a matadia. This gives a mantis an ultra-wide field of view and lets them detect even the smallest movements in its environment. But here's the twist. Insects with compound eyes usually have terrible depth perception, but mantises are the only known insects that have the true stereoscopic vision, meaning they can perceive depth, just like humans. This is critical when you're leaping at prey or launching in an ambush. You need to know exactly how far away your target is. Their vision is also motion-based. If you stand still, a mantis might not even notice you. But make the tiniest twitch, you're on the radar. Oh, and about those weird black dots on their eyes, ever notice how it looks like a mantis is always staring at you? Those are called pseudopupils, and they're actually optical illusions that show where light is being absorbed in the eye. Wherever you move, the pseudopupil moves too, making the mantis seem creepily aware of your every step. Spoiler alert, it is. And they don't just see in daylight. Some species have low light vision, allowing them to hunt at dawn, dusk, or even under moonlight. Good luck hiding. On top of their head, you got the antennae, two long, thin feelers that work like chemical detectors. They're constantly twitching, constantly sniffing the air. Praying mantises don't really rely on smell compared to other insects, but they use their antennae to detect pheromones, especially during mating season, and to help navigate their environment. Interestingly, a mantis can regrow a damaged antenna the next time it molts, just one of the several body parts they can regenerate when young. Imagine if humans can grow back a broken arm during puberty. That's the kind of biological insurance we're talking about. The thorax, the middle section of the mantis's body, is like a neck, torso, and shoulder system all in one. It's divided into three parts, the prothorax, the mesothorax, and the metathorax. The prothorax is the most important part of the praying mantis. It's elongated, flexible, and holds raptorial forelegs, which we'll talk about next. This elongated, neck-like structure is what makes the mantis lean, twist, and strike with its front legs like a martial artist. Meanwhile, the mesothorax and the metathorax anchor the middle legs and hind legs, as well as the wings. These parts are shorter and more rigid, built for stability. The thorax as a whole is supported by a hard exoskeleton made of chitin, a substance that's lightweight, durable, and resistant to damage. Basically, it's a mantis's armor. Now, we're just getting into the good stuff. The praying mantis's front legs are the insect equivalent to a T-Rex's jaws, a falcon's talons, and a bear trap, all rolled in one. These are called the raptorial forelegs, and they're built for one thing, catching and holding prey. They have rows of sharp spines, hinged joints, and are kept folded in that position that looks relaxed, but it's also deceptive. They're actually in constant tension, like a loaded spring. When prey comes within striking range, the mantis explodes into action. Its strike speed has been measured up to 70 milliseconds, faster than the blink of a human eye. That's on par with a chameleon's tongue or a trap jaw and spite. Once the mantis grabs its prey, it uses those spines to lock it into place, preventing any escape. The legs don't crush, the spines do the work by piercing and pinning the prey's body. And it's not uncommon for a mantis to begin eating its prey alive, starting with the head or legs to immobilize it. Brutal, yes. Effective, also yes. The middle and back legs are also less flashy but still important. They're long and jointed, designed for stability, not speed. A mantis doesn't just sprint across the ground like an ant or beetle. Instead, it uses a kind of swaying, calculated step that mimics the movement of wind-blown leaves. This allows it to get closer to prey without being detected. Some species also use these legs to leap, especially during a nymph stage. They don't jump like fleas, but they can launch themselves short distances with impressive accuracy, a handy trick when avoiding predators or closing in on prey. Behind the thorax, you've got the abdomen, a long, segmented structure that contains the digestive system, reproductive organs, and internal muscles. The abdomen is extremely flexible, especially in females. 
It can expand dramatically after eating or during egg laying. The mantis will rear back and fan out its wings and abdomen, displaying bold patterns or colors designed to scare off predators. Think of it like blowing up a balloon to make yourself bigger, but with bonus eye spots and color flashes. Some species can even vibrate their abdomen rapidly, producing a faint buzzing sound when threatened. It's not loud, but it adds to the illusion that they're not to be messed with. Not all mantises can fly, but most adults develop wings. There are usually two pairs, a leathery outer pair for protection and a thin membranous inner pair for actual flight. Flight isn't the mantis's first move. It's more of an escape tactic or a way to find mates. Females tend to be heavier and less agile in the air, while males are lighter and more capable flyers. In fact, during mating season, males often travel long distances to find a mate, relying on their wings to get there safely and quickly before they get eaten. But wings aren't just for flying. When threatened, many mantises will fan them out to look larger and scarier. Some species have bright eye spots or bold colors on their wings that appear suddenly, startling would-be predators. Now that we know what the praying mantis is made of, it's time to watch it in action. Because when it comes to hunting, this insect isn't just efficient, it's downright terrifying. Stealth, speed, patience, and brutal technique are all part of the playbook. Let's start at the beginning of the hunt, when the mantis locks in on a target. Unlike spiders or ants, praying mantises don't build traps or hunt in teams. They're ambush predators, and they perfected the art of stillness. Once a mantis spots a potential meal, be it a cricket, grasshopper, moth, or even a small lizard, it doesn't rush in. Instead, it freezes. Every limb, every antenna, every joint goes still. To the untrained eye, it looks like part of the plant it's clinging to. But this stillness isn't random, it's tactical. The mantis has already calculated the distance, the angle, and the timing. It's using its stereoscopic vision to get a three-dimensional map of where the prey is in space. Then comes the approach. When it decides to move, it doesn't walk like a normal insect, it sways. As it sways, it inches forward, step by cautious step. Every movement is deliberate. This isn't trial and error, it's a calculated maneuver. If the prey twitches, the mantis stops. If the wind picks up, it sways more dramatically to stay in sync with the environment. This creeping phase can last minutes, sometimes longer, especially if the target is skittish. But the mantis has patience. It will wait until it's within a striking distance, typically just a few centimeters away, and then boom. A praying mantis strike happens so fast you can't see it with the naked eye. Scientists have had to use high-speed cameras just to understand what's going on. Number one, the mantis unfolds its forelegs, which have been tucked in like switchblades. Number two, it thrusts them forward, hitting the prey with the spiky edges. Number three, the spines on the legs snap shut, locking around the prey's body. And lastly, number four, the legs retract, pulling the prey towards the mouth. All this happens in less time than it takes to blink, around 50 to 70 milliseconds, as I mentioned earlier. And once the prey is caught, it's over. Most victims don't even realize it and grab until they're halfway down the mantis's throat. The praying mantis doesn't waste time with ceremony. Once the prey is secured, it starts eating immediately, often while the victim is still alive. Depending on the size and species, the mantis might go for the head first, silencing any movement or resistance. Then it works the way down the body, using sharp mandibles to chew through exoskeleton, muscle, and organ tissue. The chewing is loud, at least on a microscopic level. If you were the size of a cricket, the sound of a mantis eating would be like someone ripping apart a turkey with pliers. And they are methodical eaters. They don't usually just suck the fluids or nibble. They consume everything, limbs, wings, eyes, internal organs, everything except for the spiny parts, which get discarded. Some species even clean their forelegs after a meal, wiping them across their mouth parts like a cat licking its paws. It's eerie, tidy, and somewhat makes it worse. Most people think that praying mantises just eat other insects, and for many species, that's true. But others have gone above and beyond. In the wild, larger mantis species have been documented eating. Small frogs, lizards, birds, yes, birds, mice, snakes, even other mantises. This isn't rare either. In 2017, researchers compiled dozens of reports of praying mantises catching and eating hummingbirds. They usually perch near hummingbird feeders, wait for one to fly close, and snatch it mid-hover. It's incredibly precise and horrifying. The bigger the mantis, the broader the menu, and because they don't use venom or traps, everything depends on whether they can grab or hold the prey. If they can do that, they'll eat it. It's one thing to be a deadly predator. It's another thing entirely to be invisible while doing it. That's the true power of the praying mantis. Before it strikes, it disappears, and that's not a figure of speech. It literally vanishes into the background. Camouflage in the animal kingdom usually comes in two major forms, background matching and destructive colorization. The praying mantis uses both, and then takes things several steps further. 
Most mantises are colored in varying shades of green, brown, beige, or gray. Why? Because those are the most dominant tones in the environment they live in. Trees, leaves, branches, grass, and bark. This isn't random pigment though. Their exoskeleton pigments are adaptive, sometimes even changing slightly depending on the humidity, temperature, or background they were raised in. This means that a predator or prey could be looking right at them and never realize it. That signature mantis sway we mentioned earlier, it serves a double purpose. First, it simulates plant movement in the wind, helping the mantis blend into natural background motion. But second, it actually confuses depth perception in other animals. Think of it like this, if you hold a perfectly still object in front of your eyes, your brain can easily estimate how far away it is. But if it's swaying in unpredictable ways, especially against a moving background, it becomes harder for predators and prey to calculate how far the mantis is, or even what it is. That split second of confusion is all the mantis needs to either strike or vanish. So far, we've seen the prey mantis as a master of stealth, disguise, and lightning fast takedowns. But we've only scratched the surface of its more controversial behavior. It's time we address the elephant in the room. Yes, we're talking about cannibalism. The praying mantis has a built-in reputation in pop culture as an insect that eats its mate. But what's really going on here? Is the female mantis really a remorseless killer of its own kind? And why does this happen in the first place? Let's break it down and separate the myth from the meat. First, let's be clear on definitions. Cannibalism in biological terms means consuming another member of your own species. And for mantises, it's not just a weird one-time behavior. It's a built-in survival strategy. There are three main types of cannibalism observed in mantises. Number one, sexual cannibalism, where one partner, usually the female, eats the other during or after mating. Number two, juvenile cannibalism, where young mantises eat their siblings or hatchmates. And number three, territorial or hunger-based cannibalism, when adult mantises consume rivals or same species prey during normal feeding. In other words, mantis cannibalism isn't just a rare or freak accident, it's a functional and often beneficial part of their lives. In the wild, cannibalism during mating is less frequent than you might think. Males are careful. They approach females slowly, sometimes taking hours to inch close enough without triggering her predator instincts. Some even jump on from a distance, hoping to catch her off guard long enough to start mating. But here's the twist. Even if she does start munching on his head or thorax during the act, mating often continues. That's because a male's mantis reproductive organs aren't controlled by his brain. Once the system is engaged, it kind of runs on autopilot. So yes, a male can continue mating while being eaten alive. If that sounds horrifying, it is. But biologically, it makes sense. The male's primary evolutionary goal is to pass on his genes. If he's successful and the female ends up better nourished, she can lay more eggs. That means more of his DNA gets out into the world, even if he doesn't live to see it. It's worth pointing out that praying mantises aren't the only animals that practice cannibalism. Spiders, frogs, fish, and even some mammals do it too, especially in high stress or low resource environments. But praying mantises are one of the most notorious examples, largely because they do it so often and with such clinical precision. So with all this, if you made it this far, congrats. You now officially know the science behind the praying mantis. Thanks for watching and I hope you enjoyed.